Hey fourth graders, it's Miss Lucy, Mr. B, and more of Wish by Barbara O'Connor. Chapter 3 That night, out on the back porch with Gus and Bertha, I saw the first star twinkling over the treetops. I closed my eyes and wished like crazy. Making a wish? Gus asked. I felt myself blush. No. Bertha nudged Gus. Tell her about the time you wished your Uncle Dean would disappear. And then he did, she said. Gus flapped his hand at her. Aw, oh, now, Bertie. She don't want to hear that boring old story. He rocked his chair, making the porch floor creak and groan. While Bertha talked a blue streak and hardly ever sat still, Gus was quiet and easygoing, with a calm, slow way about him. He wore a baseball cap all day and half the night, his scraggly brown hair poking out from under it every which way. The bill of his cap was dark brown with dirt and greasy fingerprints. That there is Pegasus, he said, pointing to a cluster of stars hovering way up over the top of the mountains in the distance. Gus should have been a scientist, Bertha said. He can tell you everything you ever wanted to know about stars and air and plants and water and weather and all that stuff. Gus let out a little poofed. And he thinks I married him for his looks, Bertha winked at me. But I married him for his brains, she said. Gus laughed. And then the most amazing thing happened. They both reached out at the exact same time and held hands. It was like somebody had said, Okay, on the count of three, hold hands. I'd never in my whole life seen Scrappy and Mama hold hands. Shoot, most of the time, they didn't even look at each other. I watched Gus and Bertha sitting there gazing at the night sky, the corners of their mouths turned up into contented smiles. Every now and then, Bertha looked dreamily over at Gus like he was a movie star and not some scraggly-haired man who worked in a mattress fa factory over in Cooperville. We stayed out there till it started to sprinkle again, a soft, cold rain that sent the cats at our feet darting inside. I went to bed that night with my head swirling. I thought about Scrappy snoring away in the county jail and Mama staring up at the ceiling of her dark bedroom. I thought about Jackie whispering gossip and painting her toenails with Carol Lee. I thought about Howard Odom with his up-down walk and his good-hearted family. And I thought about Gus and Bertha holding hands under the glow of Pegasus. And then I thought about my own pitiful self, laying there wondering if my wish would ever come true. The next day, I wore Jackie's old white majorette boots to school. I knew I'd made a mistake the minute I got on the bus. As I made my way down the aisle, some of those girls po pointed at my boots, giggling and whispering. I felt my face burn, and I glared at them. Howard motioned for me to sit next to him, but I flopped down in the seat behind him. I spent the morning drawing on my arm with a blue marker and pretending to read. At recess, Howard tried and tried to get me to let him show me around the school. I'm your backpack buddy, remember? He said. I shook my head. Forget it, I said. I'm not really interested. Besides, I I'm not going to be here much longer. Why not? I rolled my eyes. I told you, I'm going back to Raleigh. But what if your mama don't get her feet on the ground? He said. Well, what the heck kind of question was that? I stomped away from him and plopped down under the cafeteria windows and glared at the kids playing soccer on the playground. Once or twice I glanced over at Howard. He was drawing circles in the dirt with his foot and looked all mopey. When the bell rang, everyone scrambled to line up. A bunch of wild boys pushed and shoved their way in front of Howard, and he didn't even say anything. As I headed toward the line, a girl from my class named Audrey Mitchell waltzed right up to me and said, Nice boots. 
She smirked while her friends giggled behind her. I felt Scrappy's temper working its way from the tip of my toes to the top of my head. Hot as fire. Then I said, Thanks. They're good for kicking. And I kicked her skinny shin. Kicked it hard. The next few minutes were a blur of crying and hollering and tattling, and then I found myself sitting in front of Mr. Mason, the principal. While he lectured about my inappropriate behavior, I studied the inky little stars and hearts I had drawn on my arm that morning. Mr. Mason asked me if I knew that what I did was wrong, and would I like it if somebody did that to me, and a bunch of other questions I didn't even care about. I said, yes, sir, and no, sir, but I kept my eyes on my inky arm and clunked the heels of those majorette boots against the legs of my chair. I shrugged when he said he was going to have to call Bertha and tell her what I'd done. Then I went back to my class and said I was sorry to Audrey Mitchell, even though I wasn't really, and that was how my second day of school in Colby went. That afternoon, on the bus... Howard ignored my laser thoughts again and made a beeline right for me. He dropped into the seat next to me. You should save me a seat, because I think backpack buddies are supposed to sit together, he said. That's against the rules, I said. I I'm pretty sure you can save a seat for a backpack buddy. I rolled my eyes and looked out the window. Why'd you kick Audrey Mitchell? Howard asked. I told him how she had said, nice boots, with that smirk on her face. He shook his head and said, dang, Charlie, why you gotta get so mad about that? That ain't nothing. I shot him a glare. Maybe it was nothing to him, but it was something to me. I almost told him about my fiery temper that I got from Scrappy, but I didn't. Instead, I told him how I got sent home from kindergarten the very first day for, for poking some boy with a pencil. Eraser end or pointy end? Howard asked. Pointy. Dang, Charlie! I shrugged. I know, but I was mad. About what? He stuck his thumb right through my sandwich, I said. Howard shook his head again, making his red hair flop down over his glasses. Here's what you do from now on, he said. Every time you feel yourself starting to get mad, say, pineapple. Pineapple? Yeah. Why? Well, that'll be like a code word to remind yourself to simmer down, Mama taught my little brother Cotton to say rutabaga every time he gets the urge to draw on the wall. Does it work? Sometimes. That sounded like the dumbest thing I'd ever heard, but I didn't say so. We sat in silence as the bus made its way up the narrow mountain road. Every once in a while, the view out the window changed from woods, thick with pine trees and ferns and moss-covered rocks, to a wide open view of the mountains stretching on forever in the distance. A smoky haze hovered over them, soft gray against the deep blue of the mountains. That's, that's why they're called the Blue Ridge Mountains, Gus had told me the first day I got to Colby, because they're blue. Then he had gone on to explain how the color was because of something the pine trees released into the air. I didn't know what the heck he was talking about, but I had nodded like I did. When the bus got to Howard's house, he grabbed his backpack and said, Remember, pineapple. I watched him and his brother go up the rickety steps of their front porch and disappear inside the house, letting the screen door slam with a bang behind them. Next to the front door was a ratty-looking couch covered with a bedspread. Wilted, yellowing plants and dried-up flowers planted in coffee cans lined the edges of the porch. Maybe the Odom's hearts were so good that they didn't care that they lived in such a sad-looking house. The bus chugged and groaned up the winding road. I was thinking about what I was going to say to Bertha about my kicking incident when a commotion outside the window caught my eye. 
Two dogs were fighting in a dirt driveway beside a cluster of trailers. One was small and black. The other one was brown and black and skinny as all get out. A little girl was screaming and carrying on while an old man turned on a garden hose and aimed a hard spray of water at the skinny dog. Get out of here, he hollered. A woman ran out of one of the trailers and tried to grab the black dog while the skinny dog snapped and growled and then suddenly just took off running. He ran along the edge of the road beside the bus for a minute or two, his long ears flapping in the breeze. I pressed my face against the window and watched him lope along the side of the road and then turn and disappear into the woods. When I got off at Gus and Bertha's a few minutes later, I looked down at those majorette boots. Jackie had always looked so pretty in them, but I looked dumb. Those girls were right to laugh at me. That familiar mad feeling was settling over me like a blanket. But this time, I was feeling mad at myself for being a loser that nobody wanted. I stomped my foot and then I kicked the gravel, sending it tumbling into the rhododendron bushes along the side of the driveway. Then I whispered, Pineapple, before heading on up to Gus and Bertha's.